Hello, welcome. Glad you could join me. In this video, we'll be taking a slightly different approach. It will be an unscripted walkthrough of a New York Times article. The article itself was authored by a gender studies professor, Dr. Anne Faustio Sterling. Now, the interesting thing about Faustio Sterling is that not only is she a gender studies professor, she's also a qualified biologist. So this makes the article of particular interest. So what prompted me to take an interest in this article? Well, that's quite simple. It was a single tweet. Lawrence Krauss tweeted out, and I quote, It is refreshing when a little science so simply and effectively cuts through political or cultural obfuscation. Was very pleased that Professor Faustio Sterling spoke at our origin events on sex, gender and reproductive rights. Bravo! Well, the article seems to have gone down very well with Mr Krauss. The key word in this tweet is obfuscation, and we'll be returning to this particular topic several times as we go through the article, I suspect. So, is Professor Krauss correct in his assessment of Faustio Sterling's work? Well, let's read the article and find out. The article starts, Two sexes have never been enough to describe human variety. This is a bold assertion by the author, but an interesting statement. Biology does not lend itself to categorization. There are almost always exceptions to every category. However, we need to be wary when someone tries to leverage the inevitable exception in order to invalidate the general category. The first paragraph also contains references to rabbinical law for some reason, but then she makes an interesting historical detour through the Roman Empire, in order, one presumes, to highlight the brutal treatment of hermaphrodites in those times. We get the term hermaphrodite from the Latin hermaphroditus, who was the divine offspring of the gods Hermes and Aphrodite. In Roman mythology, Hermaphroditus was a somewhat eroticized character, but the Romans were superstitious, and such individuals in real life would have been regarded as a bad omen, or even divine punishment. In the next paragraph, then, we have this. Today, some governments seem to be following the Roman model. Well, I guess that explains the historical detour in the previous paragraph. Although she does go on to concede that the Hungarian government does not seem intent on infanticide in order to appease the gods, but she's understandably upset that the Hungarian government has dismissed her entire field of study, and by extension her life's work, as a nonsense. Unfortunately, the reality is that women's studies, which is more likely to be called these days gender studies, is primarily concerned with teaching feminism. Feminism is a political ideology. So when the Deputy Prime Minister of Hungary makes a statement that, and I quote, gender studies has no business in universities because it is an ideology, not a science, he has the benefit of being essentially correct. But you can understand why such pronouncements might not be well received by certain academics, who then go on to express their displeasure in articles in the New York Times. This is wrong in so many ways, morally as well as scientific. Others will explain the human damage wrought by such ruling. I will stick to the biological error. Well, dear viewer, what do you think the chances are that the good professor will stick to the biology? Let's find out, because it is at this point that Faustio Sterling will drag us into a rabbit hole. Moving on to the next paragraph, it has long been known that there is no single biological measure that unassailably places each and every human into one of two categories, male or female. In the 1950s, the psychologist John Money and his colleagues studied people born with unusual combinations of sex markers. Well, that didn't last long, did it? What happened with sticking with the biology? With impressive alacrity, we have skipped past the biology and immediately find ourselves swimming in the dubious waters of John Money's research. John Money was primarily interested in gender, not sex. It's surprising, is it not, that when you consider the wealth of papers and research, which ranges from Thomas Morgan, who published a paper in 1911, in which he concluded that some traits were sex-linked, to the discovery of Kleinfelter's and Turner's karyotypes in the late 1950s, and the explosion of genetic research in recent years, the scientific curiosity of Faustio Sterling does not extend beyond the writings of a discredited scientist 
psychologist. But it gets worse, because when we do touch on the biology, we have this. The resultant embryo has an uncommon chromosomal sex, say XXY, XYY, or XO. So even considering only the first layer of sex, we have more than two categories. This is simple misrepresentation. XXY and XYY are male, and X or XO are female. They are atypical carrier types, all of which result in syndromes. They are not examples of sex diversity, and I suggest that it is more than slightly dubious to claim otherwise, particularly if you're a biologist. The next paragraph is badly worded and somewhat confusing. Rather than unpack it, I will offer an alternative description of the process. The sperm delivers either an X or a Y chromosome to the egg, which usually contains a single X chromosome. This results in either a male fetus, XY, or a female fetus, XX. The first two trimesters of normal development relies on maternal hormones for the development of testes for males, and ovaries for females. During the third trimester, the testes and ovaries, if present, will further masculinize or feminize the fetus. I will point out the obvious here and say that we are still only dealing with two biological sexes. Before we move on to the next paragraph, I think it worth reminding ourselves what Dr. Krauss thought so wonderful about the work of Fausto Sterling. Remember the key word in his tweet, obfuscation, yet here we are halfway through the article, and it would seem that at almost every point in fetal development, potential for exciting gender alternatives increases at each stage. The gender alternatives, it would seem, are numerous, and the poor child has not yet escaped the womb. Anyway, let's move on. By birth, then, a baby has five layers of sex. Well, this is a nonsense, of course. Sex determination is a relatively mechanistic process. It has to be. Otherwise, mammals, and that includes humans, would be unable to replicate. The process requires a high degree of fidelity, for what I hope are obvious reasons. That's not to say things don't go wrong, because they do. But the simple fact of the matter is that when the sperm delivers its genetic payload, the sex is determined in the vast majority of cases, and it will be either XX or XY. The exceptions are rare, and when I say rare, I mean extremely uncommon, well below the figure put out by the likes of Faustio Sterling. She also states, and I quote, An XX baby can be born with a penis, and an XY person may have a vagina, and so on. These kinds of inconsistencies throw a monkey wrench into any plan to assign sex as male or female. Well, this is somewhat misleading. If the carrier type is 56XX and has a penis, I can guarantee that there will be SRY gene fragments located on one of the X chromosomes. It is the presence or absence of the SRY gene that determines biological sex. That is why it is called SRY, or to give it its full name, Sex Determining Region Y. If Y fragments, for whatever reason, become attached to the X chromosome, then we are dealing with a female genotype who has phenotypical male characteristics. XX male syndrome is even less common than Kleinfelder's, so it's not as clear-cut as the author would have you believe. There are not so minor details that she seems content to leave to one side for some reason. Moving on then, adding to the complexity, the layering does not stop at birth. You know, I had a suspicion it wasn't going to get any simpler. What was that word again? Obfuscation, that's the one, isn't it? Anyway, here we move on from biology to gender. And like a lot of people in the humanities, Faustio Sterling leans towards the tabula rasa theory of mind. That is, that people are blank slates. They're treated as if they really are non-player characters, simply waiting for suitable open-source code to be dropped in and run so they can fulfill some predetermined function. It really is a half-baked concept that should have been let go many, many years ago. Unfortunately for feminist scholars, they have founded their entire theoretical framework on this very misconception, and it's beginning to spring leaks at an alarming rate as research progresses. Anyway, I suppose we should address the general point made here. Sex is biological. Gender is how we perceive and describe sex. A young male is a boy, an adult female is a woman, and so on. It's primarily descriptive. 
It's how we perceive ourselves and others. The problem is that it is factorial. That is, there are many factors involved. Gender is highly correlated with sex, but there are also performative elements. We tend to conform to expectation. Humans, after all, are a social species. That should not really come as a surprise. The problem here is that Faustio Sterling has seized on a particular element, social conformity, and not simply makes the claim that it is the most important factor, but that it is the only factor to be considered in relation to gender. This is what is hinted at here in this paragraph. Here she references John Money again. Uh, it's only a small paragraph. I, I won't actually comment on John Money any further. I've done an entire video on um, John Money and his place in the, uh, the gender controversy. The title of the video is Tears for Trans Part 2. So you can watch that if you want an overview of John Money's um, research and how he fits into all this gender controversy. The interesting thing is that feminism, a lot of theories, rests heavily on Dr. Money's work because he developed the, the concept of gender identity and so on. So they think he is a pivotal figure and they seem to think that he lends them some sort of credibility. Well, you can watch the video and decide that for yourselves, whether that's true or not. Almost there, people. It's been a bit of an adventure, hasn't it? The last but one paragraph... Again, here we have the inevitable complexity. It's all so complex and layered. There is an element of truth here. There are many processes that need to happen at just the right time and in the correct order for normal development. If you want an overview of sex determination, you can view my video series, Sex Ed for the SJW, where I give a reasonable overview of sex determination and how intersex conditions arise. It's not that complicated, so don't let Faustio Sterling put you off. The devil is always in the detail, and it's relatively easy to give you quite an accurate overview without delving into the complexities. And finally, this line flies in the face of scientific consensus about sex and gender. Well, we're going to have to disagree here, because the reality is your entire body of work flies in the face of established science. The problem we have is that feminist scholars have for decades been insulated from any consequence that arise from their academic works and theories. Cohorts of students have been sent forth from the academy with their heads filled with palpable nonsense. Very few would grieve the loss of feminist studies departments. For too long they've been left to their own devices and indulged, for no reason that I can understand. And you, Dr. Krauss, I have to admit to being bloody annoyed by your tweet... It's been suggested that perhaps you were performing some bizarre penitence for your recent indiscretions. If that's the case, I got some news for you. It's not going to work. You're not dealing with entirely rational minds here. You will find empathy in short supply. If you continue in this vein, not only will they have their pound of flesh, but they will return for your blood as well. <laughs>